Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me to speak again this year and for that kind introduction. And thank you for accommodating my request to speak today in order to attend Naval Reactors change of office tomorrow between two of my great friends, Frank Caldwell and Bill Houston. How about a round of applause for SNA's team for truly knocking this event out of the park once again. I'd like to specifically thank retired Vice Admiral Rick Hunt, retired Rear Admiral Dave Hart, retired Captain Bill Erickson, Julie Howard, and Debbie Gary for organizing this wonderful event. I'd like to give a special thank you to Bill Erickson. Where are you, Bill? I know you're somewhere here on the, there we go. Bill is retiring this year after our very first SNA Executive Director after serving over 23 years of continued support following an exquisite career in uniform. We will miss you and we are ready for the fight. The force is primed and ready to maneuver into the future, due in large part to your efforts and your leadership of SNA. Join me in wishing Bill our eternal thanks and fair winds and following suit. Okay, well welcome to the 36th National SNA Symposium. This SNA is poised to be fantastic. This week alone, you'll have the chance to hear directly from our partners on Capitol Hill, from SECNAV, Del Toro, our first female CNO and Joint Chief, my boss, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, from our first female Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Fagan, our brand new SWO boss, uh, Vice Admiral Brendan McLean and our brand new Vice Chief sitting right beside him, my friend Admiral Jim Kilby and countless others. It should really speak volumes how many of these leaders are in such critical position or surface warfare officers. Rest assured that all of these leaders are working together to solidify and advance our maritime superiority. You should look forward to their updates of the action items spanning all echelons of command so that our surface Navy can move out at pace in order to maintain our overmatch against our adversaries. But the effort often doesn't end once we are rung ashore. I'd like to acknowledge retired Admiral Vern Clark, our 27th CNO for being here, who has still serves as an advisor, a mentor for many of us, in uniform as an elite member of our defense industrial base, sir. And thank you so much for allowing me to kick this event off. I am deeply honored. Though it may not come as a surprise to some, I often consider myself a cleanup hitter. So leading off this week is a welcome change. To start, I hope you enjoyed my quick video, Minute with the Commander. Since this is a surface warfighting convention full of warfighters, my team and I decided to produce that piece leading up to SNA, and naturally I wanted to show off the new two-piece organizational clothing, or Tupac. This year we expect to complete the initial rollout of the Tupac so that every sailor on board, ship or submarine, is issued at least two sets with no cost to the sailor. The Tupac uniform is not only functional, more functional than NW Type 3s on board our warship. It's safer, flame retardant, designed by sailors, and the best part about it is a sailor can finish conducting maintenance in radar room 3 or in the main equipment room 2 and then walk right off the brow and stop at the Navy Exchange for groceries on the way home. So it is a big change in regard to that. So to the entire team and those online, you should look forward to seeing our sailors sporting Tupacs across the Navy as the uniform of the day by next year. All right, seriously, I am above honored and so thrilled to be back here speaking to the leaders of the world's premier surface naval force. And it is because of all of you, those in uniform on our ships and across the waterfront, that we've been so successful, and it's always been because of you, the center of gravity of our Navy. Despite the significant challenge we face with long lead time parts, shipyard delays, less than optimal living conditions during maintenance periods, and personnel shortages across many rates and NECs, you all are just crushing it. To be honest, after I spoke at SNA last year, I wasn't so sure how my remarks would be received. 
and even more important, acted on by the defense industrial base. After voicing my displeasure about the inability to produce and deliver ordnance on time in insufficient quantity, complete maintenance availabilities and modernizations and efforts on time and on cost, and the need to be at flank speed to improve productivity, efficiency, and build rates from our public and private yards to deliver new construction and overhaul ships back to our fleet. Instead of an adverse reaction, I think it really struck a chord with industry leaders, leaders within the Department of Defense and with many con congressional members who see the problems identified the same way. I have been impressed with how many industry partners have reached out to work with me, the Navy program managers, on stepping up production through improvements using a get real, get better approach, in which we embrace the red together, self-assess together, and correct identified challenges together. Truly assessing weak errors and shifting the rudder hard over and revving the gas to get back on PIM. Our sailors deserve every lethal capability possible to go over the horizon and do our nation's bidding. The clear point I wanted to make is that we, not just in the surface community, but across the Navy, have problems that we need to address and course correct so that we are always ready to answer our nation's call. While hope springs eternal, being Pollyannish is not a winning strategy against strategic competitors we face. We have work to do here to win. We are and must remain committed to getting it done. I know everyone here understands the impact on our Navy's readiness, especially when agility, flexibility, fungibility, and responsiveness are required to surge our forces toward a crisis or to quickly maneuver to meet and defeat an adversary hell-bent over on challenging the rules-based international order all while we prepare for the high-end fight. Okay, so my goal here today at SNA is to answer Bob's question from office space. What would you say you do here? To answer that question, I want each of you to walk with me through a journey, how I view the theory of victory, and even more important, what it will take to win our nation's conflicts during this critical decade with certainty. I view my role and responsibilities at Fleet Forces Commander through three imperatives. First, for our operational war plans to work, they must all be founded on a key assumption that must hold. We must maintain continuity of government, continuity of operations, and continuity of decision making. To achieve that level of continuity, the homeland cannot repeat cannot be under strategic attack. Therefore, we must field, sustain, and ensure our Navy's contribution to strategic deterrence remains the highest priority. There can be no chinks in that portfolio, from strategic force readiness to modernization to nuclear command and control to delivery of new Columbia on time. Second, we must consistently and affordably generate combat-ready forces to meet global presence operations. But more importantly, we must have contingency, reaction forces, capable of responding with limited notice to take the fight to the enemy with sailors who are armed, trained, ready, and fierce. Third, we must set the conditions for and enable our fleet to maneuver with purpose through all domains, from seabed to space, including cyberspace, in order to mass and deliver decisive lethal effects at our timing and tempo. To achieve these ends, we must operate efficiently and effectively within and across the Department of Defense with joint force partners, Congress, industry, and intelligence stakeholders. And while we've made some gains since my remarks last year at SNA, I would argue that we have not achieved the level of readiness, production, and deliveries required in both capabilities and capacity to claim we're up on plane with a winning trajectory. Make no mistake about it, we face formidable threats on the horizon. And while the nature of war never truly changes, those threats are fundamentally changing the character of how we prepare our Navy to fight. I am sure you're all incredibly familiar with these threats. Strategic competitors and peer adversaries must be faced head on with purpose and realistic expectations with respect to the force we will have over the next several years. I know CNO and many others will speak about these adversaries and the threats they pose. However, here's my quick review so that I can tell you what I want to do about it. The sea has once again emerged as a primary focal point for peer competition. 
where the international commons are threatened and attacked with kinetic and non-kinetic fires that are growing in range, complexity, and precision, the stakes have never been higher. China and Russia are our two largest strategic competitors. Now, what is really unknown is the ever-growing concern of a new no-limits relationship between these two powers. Just last summer, they amplified and increased the amount of joint training, joint exercises, and joint demonstrations. Bombers from Russia and China operated out of China and then flew a joint mission into the Philippine Sea towards Guam. In the fall, a Russian and Chinese maritime task force of several surface and subsurface platforms conducted the largest combined patrol to date within the Indo-PACOM and NORTHCOM areas of responsibility. Just in December, four Russian and two Chinese aircraft flew a joint military air patrol composed of H-6 and Tu-95 bombers, Su-35 and J-16 fighters, which then entered South Korean air defense identification zone and turned eastward toward Japan. So their joint exercises have unquestionably increased. Their joint operations have increased. And to be frank, their rhetoric has increased. I only see their partnership growing, and that should be concerning for all of us. That's a dangerous and unpredictable, all-domain challenge that we must seek to understand more fully, including the complexity of the three-body strategic deterrence landscape. And of course, I cannot leave out the destabilizing forces like Iran, its proxies, or violent extremist organizations, as well as North Korea. North Korea continues to launch an unprecedented number of missiles to perfect the capability of holding South Korea, Japan, and the continental United States and our allies at risk of nuclear attack. Iran has un unlawfully seized multiple civilian-owned ships with legal cargo in an attempt to own the Strait of Hormuz and coerce the international community. Iran's proxies like Houthis in Yemen, Hamas in Gaza, will always keep us engaged as they continue to probe and attack our forces as they seek to destabilize the region or disrupt civilian merchants carrying our international commerce through the maritime commons and vital waterways. Now I ask you, while the geopolitical landscape has shifted and adversary navies modernize around us at a staggering pace, what are we doing to compete and sustain our advantages? What has changed substantially in how we generate our forces and prepare those forces to meet the threats I've described, given that our Navy's size, shape, and capabilities will not fundamentally change for years to come? How do we answer the call to be ready with our Navy today, provided the challenge we face with respect to the maintenance and new construction delays? Are we to be victimized by these constraints? Or can we rise above the status quo and be solution providers by ensuring we understand the readiness issues we can, can control and applying the requisite areas to those efforts? I've just described a very complex geopolitical environment with adversaries that truly pack a punch, an adversarial force that must be balanced with a global, mobile, and agile Navy capable of rapid maneuver flexible response options, and overwhelming lethality, worldwide and trained for a myriad of threats, capabilities, and tactics our sailors face in every theater of operation. Are we there yet? A wise fourth century Roman general said, if you want peace, prepare for war. Or I think that may have also been the theme to John Wick part three, I'm not sure. The calculated activities of our adversaries often reside in the gray zone, making it difficult to understand the transition between ambiguous and unambiguous indications and warning. We likely will get to pick the timing we will, when we need to be ready with forces when the fight begins. I further think it is easy to assume that the timing of a fight with a peer won't naturally align to our force generation model that is locked trained to our CVNs and LHDs. Further, I will submit to you that today's joint force, which was shaped by a 20-year land war following a sustained relative peace that came with the end of the Cold War. While the leaders that will speak at SNA recognize this and work every day to pressurize this paradigm 
to get the rudder over on what multi-domain, high-speed, long-range, modern warfare looks like takes time for the big machine of national defense to retool the underpinning apparatus of warfare ideology, policy, and organizational structure. As Secretary Rumsfeld once said, you go to war with the military you have, and I am sure we cannot afford a ramp-up period like the 1939 through 1941 time frame to wake up the sleeping giant. Therefore, I am more interested in what won't be ready for day one and what we can do now, today, to ensure the critical path for building ready and responsive forces is not based on sailors, either the number, the type, or their training. Everyone knows that you cannot surge trust, but you can't surge knowledge and mastery either. When we need to turn the volume up quickly on delivering combat power, the hardest spigot I own and will always be inextricably related to building and developing human capital, our most precious resource, our warriors. In support, my theory of the fight is prepared to shift the Navy, make it ready for battle stations, to ensure the Navy writ large is on a warfighting footing, capable of transitioning quickly across all lines of effort, to man general quarters so that we can generate the combat ready forces required to execute our response plans and provide our operational commanders the most ready players on the field. As most are aware, the Joint Force Directed Readiness Model divides our forces into readiness categories. The Navy's Immediate Response Force, or IRF, is predominantly deployed. Think Ike CSG. For my assessment, we are unmatched across the joint force in providing our Earth requirements to match the global force management demand. We are world class here, and my video illustrated that clearly. My concern lies with our contingency response forces, our SURF. Those forces that are required to be ready to flow for combat within 30 days. This is where I am applying my efforts. Readiness cannot be left on the pier, delayed in a shipyard, undelivered on a production line. Further, it can't be driven by empty recruiting stations or empty repair lockers. Fleet forces will do whatever it takes to provide a global, mobile, and agile force capable of rapid maneuver, equipped with flexible response options, and overwhelming lethality agnostic to theater-specific threats, but able to adapt tactics and techniques to decisively defeat our adversaries at our timing and location of choice. Simply stated, as part of that vision, our surface forces are and will remain the critical contributor to our responsibility as a Navy to establish sea control when required, project power globally to deter, and win maritime conflicts on terms favorable to the United States. We are at an inflection point where our day-to-day -day decisions must be rooted in winning this strategic competition, whether in government, defense, and even in the business sector. Okay, real enough for you? Now that we've got real, let's talk about getting better. I've given you my theory of the fight. Allow me to take a few moments to describe the various fleet forces initiatives that are designed and being worked every day to operationalize it. We're going to need each and every one of you to contribute whether it's on the deck plates, in the program offices, on the production floor, in the testing facility, recruiting the next generation to serve, or welding pipes in the shipyard and our repair facilities. Our Navy is the greatest the world has ever known because of our truly outstanding people. As Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks said, quote, our people are the one advantage they can never blunt, steal or copy. We outmatch our adversaries by outthinking, out strategizing and out maneuvering them. It is critically important to get this right. And I take the responsibility of building resilient warfighters seriously. Our profession demands decisive victory in all of our endeavors. We will forge an elite warfighting force by maturing sailors over a career development continuum that can assess, innovate, and execute both technically and tactically. We will win with sailors who can master and engage their weapon systems with speed, effect, and absolute lethality across the full spectrum of modern warfare. Some of my key efforts include Ready Relevant Learning, which is the Navy's long-term training investment 
to enhance fleet mission readiness by continually improving sailors' competency and their performance by ensuring they have the knowledge and skills at the right time to maintain and operate their equipment and systems at the varsity level. But what's the first thing we do when sailors fresh out of Dahlgren or sea school as eager warriors ready to make a difference? We task them with hours of maintenance, with outdated technologies and inefficient work control processes, and then load them up with low value collateral duties. Collateral duties that in many cases could easily be centralized, combined, or eliminated with innovative approaches. That's why we are spearheading two very important initiatives, fleet maintenance optimization and the collateral duties process improvement sprint. Fleet maintenance optimization provides sailors and shore-based maintenance personnel modern, relevant, and effective information systems to maximize material readiness and operational availability of our warfighting units with goals like reducing PMS workload to less than 10 hours per sailor per week for DDG, DDG class ships and empowering the work control tools they need at the point of maintenance through tablet-based technologies. And while we know not all collateral duties can be eliminated, we are aggressively seeking to reduce, combine, and centralize many of these additional duties to reduce the number of instantiations at each command in order to free up time for allow commanding officers to focus on warfighting readiness. The next level of effort logically flows so that once we have highly trained and resilient warfighters and we bought some time back for them, we can then begin forging them into effective warfighting teams. A warfighting team that views their missions through a warfighting lens. Whether it's Condition 2 Air Warfare Team on station in the Red Sea, the Regional Maintenance Center providing an onboard tech assist to correct a red line, the OEM expediting parts, a group of subject matter experts getting a critical system back online for Comp2X, or a shipyard work center shop working overtime to get a ship ready for sea trials. We must be all in all the time. While Get Real, Get Better has done a great job removing unacceptable variability in performance between our best and worst performers, I'm looking to take the next step so that our fleet is postured to sustain and strengthen deterrence against our most consequential strategic competitors and pacing adversaries, and if necessary, dominate and win that fight. Some of these LOEs include treating our shore infrastructure like a platform, with Shore C2, it must have codified governance, clear lines of accountability, standardized quality and performance metrics, all informed by risk to the force and risk to mission through the fleet commander's eyes. Examples of improvements include by making the commander Naval Installations Command the type commander for shore infrastructure, we enable a singular responsible and accountable officer to effectively command and control public works operations routine maintenance, preventive or corrective, and readiness of fleet services on our installations through the paradigm that the shore is a warfighting platform. By assigning regional commanders as naval shore force commanders who report to the fleet commanders, the risk model is normalized and aligned more effectively so that the deferral of planned maintenance or repairs to critical shore-based systems and facilities require fleet commanders to be part of that decision-making process. As part of the C5I integrated campaign plan, my team is working to improve the training, material condition, and interoperability of C5I systems earlier in the OFRP by reducing and re resolving technical issues that are currently discovered just in time by the deploying group systems interoperability testing DG SIT during COMP2X. DG SIT should and will go back to what it was designed to be, an assessment of interoperability readiness and not a process to groom C5I systems, train watchstanders, and compensate for equipment that is not being properly maintained throughout the force generation process. To compete in this competition, we must have great support facilities and C5I systems in the best material condition possible so that our sailors, our watch teams, and our strike group staffs are ready for the challenging combat operations they will likely encounter with ever shrinking notice. Okay, now that we got our steely-eyed warfighters supported and interoperable, 
The next step is to train and certify them to surge as well as be ready to conduct major combat operations. The main efforts here are our OFRP renovation and force readiness analytic efforts. The goal is to build an OFRP model better designed to balance fleet presence and response, integrate new operational concepts better, and leverage training and certification innovation to balance capacity and capability to enhance force flexibility, fungibility, and resiliency. This requires higher training density during basic and advanced phases, more stable and balanced crewing models, and an understanding of the limb facts to achieve these goals. Limb facts like reducing the number of critical NECs required, the size, shape, and role of organizations like the afloat training groups, the roles and responsibilities of the new surface readiness groups, and how to better incorporate innovation like live virtual and constructive or LVC technologies into the force generation milestone events. With respect to LVC, we should all understand that modern warfare's intensity and complexity cannot be adequately replicated in a pure live or synthetic environment for a multitude of reasons. LVC is the fleet's premier distributed training method that seamlessly integrates platforms and systems across the Navy's continuous training environment in CTE network. For instance, during large-scale exercise 23, LVC connected nine maritime operation centers, eight strike group staffs, and over 20 ships across 22 time zones, providing training from the tactical to the operational level of warfare in one holistic, agile, red team-informed threat environment with a dynamic common operation picture within a realistic geographic construct. No other fighting force in the world has the capability to train, certify, and integrate effects the way our Navy can. But we are just scratching the surface of how to utilize LVC fully. We also used LSE 23 to expand the One Atlantic concept to other areas of operation. I referenced earlier how China and Russia launched a joint patrol over the summer that attempted to expose and exploit seams in the unified command plan boundaries and stress the command and control of assigned forces, but we were ready. One Atlantic allows the Navy to continually provide certified combat-ready forces that can maneuver across the UCOM and NORTHCOM seams with ease to maximize their effectiveness. You've likely heard of our task group Greyhound, surface ships being on call. We've also utilized submarine forces in the same manner with the Wolfpack Initiative to defend our nation against the persistent proximate threats in the Atlantic. With all of these efforts, our overall goal is to improve the level of warfighting lethality earlier in the force generation life cycle. Potential conflict with peer adversaries is simply not a function of our peacetime presence generation model. We must increase our readiness and responsiveness. I believe if we can coordinate and implement these programs and initiatives, fleet forces will be able to provide a global, mobile, and agile force capable of rapid maneuver, equipped with flexible response op options, and overwhelming lethality agnostic to theater-specific threats, but able to adapt tactics and techniques to decisively respond and defeat any adversaries at our timing and location of choice. And we have done it recently with remarkable success, proven by the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Hamas's violent attack on Israel. However, in both cases, the process was reactive and accomplished with Herculean efforts by many organizations. There's no reasons we can't be more proactive with standing processes, procedures, and policies to increase the number of combat surge-ready forces. I know Brendan McLean and Joe Cahill are working this hard with their readiness North Star and response plan efforts. When we started the OFRP journey about a decade ago, the assumptions were well-founded at the time and in general served us well while we enjoyed a time in naval history that was predominantly based on countering VEOs, using a deployment model that did not demand the level of responsiveness required today. As a result, today we typically generate forces with our model to support global force management presence requirements from peacetime rotations. Our current OFRP model works well in this regard, is evidenced by how the U.S. Atlantic Fleet forces right now are operating covertly with impunity in the high north, 
patrolling in the eastern Mediterranean, ready to support Israel or respond to Russian aggression, as well as conducting operations in support of Fifth Fleet to keep critical sea lanes open by preventing the disruption of commercial trade and internationally recognized trade routes. We should all be proud of our sailors and how our Navy is operating in these critical areas. However, these examples are not what we will face in the high-end conflict or how that demand signal will unfold. Bottom line, the OFRP was not built to generate combat-ready ships and air wings to meet the demand signal against peer adversaries. During peacetime force generation, the OFRP provides a steady supply of ready naval forces for a wide range of global presence operations, but it is not optimized to shift into high gear and generate, deploy, and regenerate a large surge of combat-ready maritime forces. So how will we manage force generation as ever-shrinking INW windows demand force flows well beyond the current OFRP design? This is where a major effort by my staff fits in the development of a global maritime response plan, a holistic, full spectrum, all hands on deck plan that identifies assumptions, permissions, authorities, and waivers that activate stakeholders to meet the increased demand tied to indication and warnings in order to generate, prioritize, and sustain combat-ready forces by leveraging a comprehensive decision matrix across all phases of warfare. This is a challenging problem. However, our get real, get better culture demands we face this head on, resisting the normal inclination to become paralyzed in problem admiration, overwhelmed that the solution set is too hard, requires too much time, money, or energy. With today's threats, we simply have no choice. The Global Maritime Response Plan is being designed to give the CNO a way to shift the Navy from peacetime to wartime. This will bolster key organization, combine others, devolve or shut down lower priority commands and functions. The Global Maritime Response Plan development is well underway. We are currently building out the decision support matrices and the response conditions, or RESCONs, think like DEFCON. They will be used to control how the Navy will be put on the required warfighting footing to best support operational commanders. I look forward to eventually being able to test the Global Maritime Response Plan and the associated RESCONs during fleet exercise scenarios across all, across all echelons on a routine basis. As I bring my remarks to an end, I will offer that we can get after many of these initiatives without any new authorities, without additional lines of funding, or shifting any resources. But for the Global Maritime Response Plan to reach its full potential, our defense industrial partners, no, our defense production team, will have to think about what triggers place your activities on a warfare footing. How do you scale your operations and production? How quickly can you respond? It will likely take iteration, and Rev-1 should be in run today. We have to think about what we won't currently bring to the fight on day one and what we need to change today in order to have the most lethal combat credible forces on the field, on time, on target, ready to defeat any adversary in order to win our nation's war with the Navy we actually have. Because as you can see, since Russia invaded Ukraine and Hamas launched its attack on Israel and civilian merchants in the shipping lanes, the Navy, your sailors on surface ships like Kearney, Thomas Hudner, Gravely, Mason, and Laboon, have answered the call, shooting down over 62 one-way UAVs, rockets, crews, and ballistic missiles. The U.S. Surface Navy and its sailors remain the world's premier fighting force, always on Alpha Station, staring down the adversary while protecting our prosperity and winning our nation's wars. I know that you will continue to prevail. Why? Because no adversary in their right mind wants to confront our surface fleet. No adversary comes close to the all-inspired might of a U.S. surface combatant. Our surface warriors are feared. The maritime environment is our domain. We set conditions for victory. I look forward to your questions and getting after it together. Thank you.
Thank you. Admiral, that was terrific. I think you've uh, summarized it very coherently. People understand, I think the vast majority of the folks under agree, or agree rather, that, uh, that we need to, to take a slightly different approach. So where are we in executing these changes? And, and what, what's the time frame to get to where you think we need to be, uh, where we become a little more comfortable and, and clearly we've responded immediately. I, I think you're right on, if it builds, if, it, uh, if the challenges continue to increase, that 30-day surge and then steady state yeah. at that 30-day surge gets to be a challenge. What are the big areas? How does industry help? What do we need to, to think about to make this execute? Well, let me, let me talk a little bit about a couple of the things I mentioned. I'll start with ready, relevant learning. We have been on a journey on this where we stagnated for a while on this. I want everyone that's here today and online to know this is running at scale and at pace now. And I am very proud of that program. I was turned this over from Admiral Grady, who thought a lot about it. And for a while, we lived in denial in the Navy, like, you know, this is like a thing. I'm not sure what they're trying to do. Now every type commander, every community of practice recognize this is how we train our sailors. And so these, this continuing of learning that we are building for our sailors and the understanding of what training has got to be done has been embraced by our type commanders. I take quarterly IPRs on it. Uh, PEO MLB is a fantastic partner in this and it has really uh, transformed in the last couple of years. So that's kind of the, the training side. On the fleet maintenance optimization, again, think about just, you know, one of the things that I was talking with some of the press uh, this morning about, historically in our Navy, we've had a tendency to take a crappy paper system and just turn it into a crappy online system, okay? <laughs> so when I go try to look at it, you know, it just looks like the same thing I did, you know, over here on paper, just as, now it's in a computer. So the idea of this fleet, fleet maintenance optimization is no kidding. Using the power of data, algorithms, uh, networks, dashboards, situational awareness to give our, our maintenance operations centers and folks who are maintaining our ships and, and need that level of situational awareness to target resources most effectively. So at that level, that's what that's going to do. At the point of actual repair, preventive or corrective maintenance, it's going to provide sailors information on how they digest it. It is going to actually give the tag out, the work controls process, the drawing, the procedure, and eventually, and in many cases, we're well down the road, a video of how to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be tablet informed. And so all that's gonna just fundamentally change, I think, what happened when we consolidated I and D level maintenance years ago. We're gonna get back our ability to sustain our Navy at sea. So better situational awareness for the folks that are targeting repair efforts at, at the operation centers and better ability for junior sailors coming through our pipeline to actually conduct things they wouldn't normally take on. Now for the, this, this idea of this response plan, we've sent out a task order on this, okay, to, to solicit the work, quite frankly, that a lot of communities of practice already have. So step one of this is just compiling work that we've already got in place. Everyone probably is very familiar in this room about the submarine response plan. Mm -hmm. Everyone's probably becoming familiar, you won't by the end of SNA, we'll know about the surface response plan. And that's got a lot of teeth in it. NAVC is working the swarm requirement on how they go to battle stations. I know uh, uh, Vice Admiral Mustin in the reserve component is building how he basically puts his forces in a way to go to battle stations. You know, how I build a battle bill so that every sailor in the Navy knows where they need to be when the fight starts to bring most effect. So what's that battle watch bill look like? So the N1s are working that. So there's a lot of pieces to this global maritime response plan that came out of a war game we did on how we're gonna sustain the fight long term. And it was recognized post that war game that while we've got O plans and we've got tip fids, and we've got all these things. We need a document that has a decision support matrix that basically starts running down as we start seeing the indications of warning saying we could kick off here. So what are the things left of that that I've got to start doing? Do I need to seek authorities to actually load ordinance on the pier? That ought to be a standing part of the plan. I send that message, I get the secretariat waiver. Those types of things, contracts that need to be in place that are basically shells that are ready to execute. 
to increase the capacity of flowing food or, or supplies, whatever that might look like. So um, we're trying to get this body of work together and assemble it in a cogent package so that the fleet commanders, S2 and S1, has something that we can break open and know how to support the forward commanders. I, I think that's absolutely great, and I really appreciate using this venue to communicate that to the audience out here. Is that, do you envision that uh, that philosophy and the approach, the tools that it takes to, to execute that are getting into the schoolhouse that we're able to transmit that through the fleet, both officer and enlisted? It, it, or is that down the road a little bit? No, I know, I think it's there. You know, it does take time to penetrate deep in an organization. I, I'm just extremely proud of the type commanders and the work they're doing here. I mean, you know, in most of the type commanders within their seven organization, you know, have this connected tissue that, you know, as a submariner, we've enjoyed a long time with our schoolhouses in Netsy. It's symbiotic. And the rest of the communities are building that depth of relationship where the schoolhouse commander doesn't think the chain of command's Netsy, they think the chain of command is Joe Cahill, right? And so there's a clear understanding that it is the type commander who sets the requirements for this training, who has the responsibility to deliver and update and make sure that training is hitting the mark, to make sure that the culture of what we're trying to do is, comes with that. So that, we're trying to get that alignment now where we don't, we're not in an outsourced mode, we're in an ownership mode. And it almost sounds like you're taking best practices between different communities sharing that knowledge and, and, and seeing what we can do to holistically. Fair. Yes. So that, that, that's terrific. We talked a little bit about uh, you know, maintenance into the future, condition-based maintenance. I think it goes absolutely hand in hand with what you're talking about. Uh, that, that's gonna be something that we will see on Constellation. I think it's gonna go into DDGX. Harder to retrofit, uh, as you pointed out, because of the sensors that are required in yep. the equipment. Uh, it sounds like we are committed to going forward with that. I think MLB is there. I think your four shop is very supportive of that. Uh, any, any thoughts on you know, the advantages of, of that sort of approach? Yeah, yes, I think the condition bait maintenance is a good use case of a lot of different things that need to be done like this. Where, of course, big data analytics are in play. We have volumes of data that we're trying to learn how to mine through with different algorithmic approaches with CASREP data, re reliability data, uh, supply data, all this to get a sense of that body of, of understanding. Uh, so, and then there's algorithms to go try to get after that. As you and I discussed, when the, the epitome of um, uh, condition made maintenance I think relies on a couple things. One, a great sensor package, okay? That sensor package is in the key locations of that piece of equipment that has the ability to, in real time, give understanding not only to ship's force, but if allowed through the comms posh or up echelon to the maintenance yeah. operations center. So again, I'm not having to wait on a call and have a single point like a CAS rep tell me about a thing. I am ahead of it. I've already got parts are in route. You know, hey, come up to the cage, get your part. Your motor generator needs a new bearing. And, and, and it needs to be installed. So to get ahead of that, that's got to be empowered with a sensor package. I also believe that it needs, and we talked about this, everything needs digital twins. And so this digital twin work allows a, a full model to be built to allow us to run those algorithms through a Monte Carlo type uh, approach and ensure that the risk that we're going to buy down by maybe not doing PMS on some artificially generated periodicity is acceptable to the fleet commanders by the way we can run that model against that, against that digital twin. So I think that's required too. And that needs to be built, sir, from the ground up. As you said, it's hard to go back and backfill you know, a, an analog gauge when I could have put a digital device in at time of construction. So my expectation is that Constellation comes with that, DDGX comes with that, SSNX comes with that, NJAD comes with that, all of those platforms that we build in the future need to be mindful that we've got to buy back time so that we're not wasting time with sailors trying to do maintenance but actually learn how to fight. The last thing I'll say on this is if we get this right, then the manning model of a surface ship or anything is based on standing watch, based on going to battle stations, based on fighting. 
and not based on, not the driver won't be based on maintenance because I've freed that time up. And uh, there's been some great things we've done in that space with Admiral Morley on some test cases. And we've done some great things that we're about to roll out with PEO MLB with the Mitcher on, on what we're going right. to do on this first loop of what this fleet maintenance optimization looks like with the tablet informed technology. Yeah, great comments. And I love the idea of focusing on warfighting. And I think you can free up a lot of time if sure. we do it properly. So terrific. I want to go and talk a little bit about Navy family. Uh, you know, and when I, when I say that, it's our sailors certainly, but it's those uh, that, that stay behind when they go out in, in harm's way. And so how are we doing in that? What's the health uh, you know, and welfare of the folks that stay behind? Yeah. And, and what are we doing to make that as good as we possibly can for them? Well, uh, you know, if, if folks that work with me certainly know me well enough to know that I hope that, they, that I come across as the, the, a commander who has a deep concern and passion for not only our sailors, but their families. That's their total wellness, okay? The whole of it, from emotional wellness, mental, cognitive, financial, spiritual, the entire thing, we have worked hard to make a total sailor. And a sailor can only be as good as the support system that sailor has. And we all know that when we deploy, or when we're doing local operations, or spending the night in a duty section, it is that family that bears a brunt of continuing to raise our families and, and has this load on them. My goal, sir, is that I make that plane that they live on as frictionless as possible. I want the services we provide them to be available without a Herculean effort. That's medical capacity, medical services, the ease of getting into MHS Genesis and actually scheduling an appointment without it requiring you know, a PhD in information technology, okay? I, I want them to be able to go do those type of things. I want them to come to work and get through the gate with enough guards that they're not standing in line for 30 minutes, so they gotta leave 30 minutes earlier than they already have a large work day. I want them to get to the waterfront, wherever they might be, and have parking, okay? I want them to get on board the ship and have these maintenance and work control processes that give them the relative understanding of how to go do their job so they can go home, okay? I want them to be able to do things that, that every human naturally should be able to do. Check their phone and see, can they pay their car bill? Because they've got Wi-Fi. And so they'll be able to have Wi-Fi in their barracks. They'll need Wi-Fi at the maintenance site. You know, our, our bases historically don't have good cellular connectivity. Our base commanders are working that hard to increase that. But everybody needs to check. That's just the nature we live in. It's crazy to resist that. Everyone knows I don't like sailors living on ships. Okay, I think sailors should have their own privacy. You get back from sea, you get off the ship. Okay, that's where I want them. I want them to have some privacy. I want them to be able to have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever that case may be. Okay, so these things that, that you know, what is a facsimile to everyone here who's got a kid that's gone to a dormitory when you vis visited the college where your child goes, why would I expect anything less for our sailors than what I'd expect for my child to go to a college? If I walked into a dormitory room at a university and it, and it looked like some of the unaccompanied housing that we make our sailors stay in, we would just about face and head right on. We wouldn't stay there. So what, are that, what is that quality of service, that level of expectation that those things need? So uh, getting paid on time, okay? Getting their DD-214 when they get out on time. All these things are extremely important. The Navy has really embraced this. And we we're all ahead flank and getting a lot of these things fixed. So I'm really proud of the coordination between the Echelon 2 fleet commanders and Echelon 1 on, the, on these areas. And Scotty Gray, by the way, if he's listening, he's got a huge shout out on all this. So. Great. Uh, one of the questions that's come in is, how do you and your team harmonize global maritime response plan with your sister services? So beyond communities, the other uh, par uh, service partners out there across all domains both in its inception, but also to maintain the joint hand handrail throughout its li lifetime. I'm assuming by, we're saying like, if the Navy's generating in a model like I'm describing, you know, first of all, let me clarify that, you know, the R4P is just gonna be a loop that continues to go. And one of the questions that came up today during the, my media time this morning, and I wanna clarify this, cause sometimes it gets confused that there's something that's preempting OFRP so the Global Maritime Response Plan is in addition to OFRP. 
We have about 300 ships in the Navy, and about 100 of those are in a depot posture that you really can't do anything with. About 100 of those every day are deployed. It's this other 100 I'm going after. How do I get this other 100 at the highest state of readiness the quick as I can so that if I need mm -hmm. them, I can dip into that as the well I go to? Because that 300, if you just look at the graph of how you change over a period of time on the, what we consider to be the decade of concern, it's just not going to change a lot. But what can change a lot is this amount. So that's what this is about. The OFRP is going to generate GFM and peacetime model. That's a machine that's going to do that. I'm suggesting that in the interim, since I don't get the sustainment period at the end of a deployment that we kind of built the thing around because of maintenance delays, until I get that fixed, while I'm actually generating toward MCO, major combat operations, I get left and get that force ready sooner. That's all I'm suggesting. I think everyone can see and embrace that idea. Now, uh, does that have anything to do with the force I offer to the joint force uh, about produce, pushing more uh, you know, uh, GFM? No, it has nothing to do with that. This is about having a surf that the directed readiness tables requires the Navy to have. It's contingency based. Because there's more to do when I make it combat surge ready. There's other missions that may not be fully at their level that they get at the end of Comp 2X. So that's, th those are going to work harmoniously. Uh, the other joint force, do they have a model that looks like this? Um, no. You know they don't. I think so. <laughs> no, we, we own this space. Yeah. I mean, look at where, I mean, just what's in the news? You know, that's, that's just telling. Uh, I do want some, a chance to talk with some of them. You know, I'm about to have an office call with uh, General Alvin, Air Force. And uh, he's a great friend of mine, and, and it'll come up. You know, I'm telling him what I'm doing, and uh, I hope he can understand maybe there's a way for the Air Force to follow suit. Great. We, we finished the international panel uh, shortly before this. One of the things that came up was unmanned. So a question that we have here is, do you see unmanned combatants as feasible augmentation for the manning shortage? If so, do you see this impacting the building industry by unmanned ultimately being replaced, uh, replacing manned combatants. Mm. Yeah, I get this question quite a bit. I think what everybody should know is good, uncrewed, unmanned, autonomous, robotic type technologies have to be uh, employed with what I consider to be a very sound concept of operations. And the CONOP that actually goes and leverages that technology, in my mind, often is lacking. You know, it's not always clear to me in high-end combat how I get it to the last tactical mile. It's not always clear to me how it follows the normal organized trainer equip construct of 05 commander, ISIC type commander to make sure that it's maintained and sustained. You know, if one washes ashore, who goes gets that? Is that the Seventh Fleet commander or do I call, you know, sub pack, whatever, you see? So, you know, the ownership model and how I, I generate these unmanned systems is still nascent. So how I employ them, what can they do, and how do I sustain and generate them? How do I back that out and build sailors that know how to operate, program, sustain those? All that full spectrum tail that comes with any type of new technology has got to be, you know, matured, to be frank about that. I would just tell you that, um, Replacing manned completely, that is no way it's happening in anyone in this room's lifetime. That's just not happening. Can I buy down risk with some operations that I don't want to expose humans to in high-end combat? You better believe it. Can I penetrate a minefield you know, with some unmanned technology? Okay? Can I fly something in a hostile environment where I don't have air dominance or air superiority? You better believe it. Okay? Can I have a, something to give me maritime domain awareness that if it gets shot or killed, or I just send in another one. You better believe it. So there's a lot of application here. But when it comes down to lethal combat, I'm not gonna, I don't think you're going to see our humans off of our combat vessels and aircraft. Slightly different kind of question. Maybe make it the last one and then give you a chance to, to have any closing comments. Uh, there, there's been a ton of innovation going on in Ukraine. The things that we have seen over there, I think the same kind of thing in Israel and the Middle East, uh, and, and perhaps even in the Western Pacific uh, with China. What, 
what do you think are some of the biggest surprises or the biggest lessons that we have taken in our rapidly adapting in training and fielding, uh, maybe to mimic that or to at least address that capability if used against us? I mean, it's a, it's a huge question. I would tell you that, you know, uh, perhaps desperation is the mother of invention a little bit for Ukraine. And uh, you get very creative when you're, when you're existentially challenged. And I think you're seeing some of the things they've done on how they're being created with using some of their unmanned, how they're uh, in, you know, using scanty information to conduct some of their lethal operations, how they're trying to sustain that, and just quite frankly, how tough they've been. You know, so this idea of the dagger in the teeth approach to warfare, you know, which no one knows how their country, how their warriors are gonna to respond till they're put in that. So that's a part of it. But for us, I think what we're trying to do is have a, 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 what we call our fleet learning continuum here. So when we see something that we need to work on in the theater, whatever that is, when that comes back, that gets integrated immediately through the folks that are sitting on this front row here into the training houses, okay, mm -hmm. into the certification model, the basic phase curriculum, advanced trades, uh, phase with SMITIC, uh, the flow training group, uh, how we actually go and program live virtual constructive to, fact, to be facsimile of those new weapon systems so that we can actually train operators what that looks like. Let's say hypersonic, I can actually say program that in. So that gives me a lot of ability to have a very fast uh, loop on that. Strike Group 4 and 15 both are world class at adapting to what's happening in the forward uh, numbered fleet commanders theaters. And that every loop we do with Comp2X and the fourth generation model is incorporating those lessons learned. And a lot of that comes right from the horse's mouth of our strike group commanders and the warfare commanders on those strike groups. This is what we need. And it's things like shot doctrine. You know, you have a shot doctrine that's based on a type of threat. You know, the ship itself has a hard time maybe adjusting shot doctrine on the fly. So it's the expectation that the warfare development centers and the type commanders get after that to make sure we're not wasting ammunition and making sure that the shot doctrine is meeting the threat. That's a, an example. Yeah, very good. You know, I'll just put a plug in for the surface witties. You know, I, th I think that has been a huge change in our approach. Uh, I think it contributes to kind of that rapid turnover. And any, any thoughts or comments you'd have on, on that well, aspect? Well, you know, I came in from dinner last night with my wife and I get to the, uh, to the bar here and I, and then I got this wave, <laughs> wave of witties. <laughs> okay, there's like 200 of them. And Wilson, Wilson, are you in the room here? Is he in the room somewhere, Wilson Marks? Anyway, he comes up to me and he's like a father. You know, he comes and it's like, these are his little kids, you know, his, his, his spawn out here that have, you know, they've been generated in the, in, in the witty world. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, ha what we challenge these young witties to do in, the, in schoolhouses, uh, at the warfare development centers and at in onboard ships is extraordinary. Anybody thought this was a, a something that was that did not have high return on investment is exactly wrong. And where I get to see eye-watering level of this is when I go to Warcom every year out at Fallon, and yep. these young witty officers are briefing senior officers about high-end tactical warfare and how we wring out every ounce of what we have today to actually stick it to our enemy. And they are world class at this. So. Admiral, it's been terrific. I appreciate that. If you have any closing remarks, I'll give you that opportunity. No, I look forward to SNA every year. Uh, some of my, you know, I'd say so many of my greatest friends in the flag war room and just throughout are surface warfare officers. They have empowered me, shaped my career. They're my, they're my a lot of, in many cases, best friends. Uh, you know, I just got through talking with the, uh, the vice chairman, just had an office call with him, and he's been my boss many times, and it's shaped so much of how I think. And uh, again, the talent in the surface Navy is, again, staggering. I could not be more proud to be here today and to share in this event, the 36 SNA conference. Sir, thank you for coming back. You're a repeater here. This is terrific. Thank you for your leadership and guidance for our Navy. Thank you, thank you sir.